So I'm really pleased to introduce our three presenters today. Tripp is a director with NG Impact Sustainability Solutions. He has 15 years of experience as a strategy consultant to senior executives in the development of climate and energy strategies. His focus is on managing the cultural dynamics of strategy and building high levels of stakeholder alignment throughout the strategy development process. Tripp has worked with corporations, nonprofits, and cities. Recently, he supported the city of San Jose in creating Climate Smart San Jose, a climate action plan framed around how sustainability can enhance the good life. He lives in the Bay Area here in Oakland, California, and has an MBA from UC Berkeley. First, we'll hear from Tripp, then we're going to hear from Peter, who has been the City of Fayetteville Environmental and Sustainability Director since 2012 and has managed several sustainability projects and accomplishments for the city, including the adoption of Fayetteville's first energy action plan, the adoption of 100% clean energy goals, launching Arkansas's first PACE program, Fayetteville becoming Arkansas's only three-star sustainability certified community, achieving the state's first silver de designation as a bicycle-friendly community, managing Arkansas's largest solar array on municipal property, and also managing Fayetteville's cultural arts corridor project. In addition to all of that, <laughs> to being Fayetteville's sustainability department director, he also manages the city's recycling and trash collections division, which we'll hear a little bit about today as well, and parking division. And um, third, we're going to hear from Christine Knapp, who's appointed as was appointed as the director of the Office of Sustainability for the City of Phil Philadelphia under Mayor Jim Kenney in January of 2016. Previously, she, she served in leadership roles at the Philadelphia Water Department, the U.S. Department of Energy's Energy Efficient Buildings Hub, and at Penn Future, where she advocated for the creation of a municipal sustainability office. So fantastic lineup. We're excited to have you guys. And with that, I'm going to pass the ball over to you, Tripp. Tripp, take it away. Great. Thank you, Jesse. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you all for, for coming. Um, so uh, for today's conversation, I wanted to explore how cities are experiencing and responding to compounding crises of COVID-19 and climate emergencies such as heat waves and wildfires that unfortunately have become annual events. Um, so we'll hear in this hour together how two cities of different size and geography are managing that tension of addressing short-term crises as well as thinking about uh, the long term. And as I do this, I wanted to offer a framework for our conversation today, which is the idea of pace layers. Um, so this idea was initially developed by Stuart Brand of the Long Now Foundation uh, based on observation he had on buildings, actually, and how different layers within a building change at different weight rates. So you can think of interior walls painted every three years, moving walls and interior renovations every 10 to 15, and then foundations every 30 or more. Um, he then applied this to society writ large, identifying different layers and ordering them based on their pace of change. The outer layers move faster than the inner layers. Those outer layers of technology, the economy, uh, and infrastructure uh, are driven by the inner layers. So an example of this is Silicon Valley, which has rapid tech innovation. But this emerged because there's an economic system that supports innovation, venture capitalists, infrastructure that educates the workforce, Stanford, governance that has rules that allows for the ownership of ideas, patents, uh, and an American culture with a rich history of tech progress, of American ingenuity. Those inner layers have more inertia than the outer. They're more resistant to change and slow to move. Um, so for the last 10,000 years, in nature, we've had the Holocene, we've had a relatively stable climate that's enabled the development of agriculture, the cities, and of human civilization. However, the pace of change within nature is accelerating and rapidly. So in this slide, you can see, well, the number of natural catastrophes have been increasing at an alarming rate, threefold in the last 40 years and twofold in the last 10. So this slide shows the major events in 2019, and you'll note there in the lower right um, are the horrible wildfires that devastated Australia uh, just this past few months. So nature has accelerated her pace um, dramatically, and 
we need to increase the pace of change of all the other layers in order to create a resilient system, uh, which is represented by that green line, um, so that we can shield it from the increasing numbers of climate emergencies and other events. Um, we need a culture, a government, an infrastructure, economy, and technology that are up on the green line. And while we have made progress, uh, we're not there. And um, as many of us know, we often get stuck because of underlying cultural mindsets and government institutions that were not built to move fast enough, which is making our infrastructure and our economy increasingly vulnerable to the more extreme and compounding disasters we are and will likely continue to face, like COVID-19, combining with extreme climate events that may accompany this summer. The result is that there's a real tension uh, and trade-off between allocating resources that address the immediate needs that come with a crisis of protective gear, of testing, of sheltering in place, uh, and the investment needed to build a more resilient infrastructure. And cities are on the front lines of managing that tension, which is why we have two sustainability leaders, Peter and Christine, here to share um, how they're managing that tension of their long-term sustainability vision and goals, um, and how those have been impacted by uh, COVID-19. Um, so with that, uh, I'll pass it off to Peter. Thank you very much, Tripp. I will attempt to show my slides here. All right. Uh, again, my name is Peter Nierengarten. I'm the uh, environmental director for City of Fayetteville, Arkansas. I wear a number of hats uh, at the city, including overseeing some of our operational divisions and departments, um, and then also leading our sustainability uh, planning and policy development team uh, in our sustainability department. So just a little uh, quick orientation on um, from Fayetteville. Uh, for those who don't know who we are or where we're located, uh, we're in the northwest corner of the state of Arkansas, one county over from Oklahoma, two counties down from the uh, state of Missouri, uh, third largest city in the state of Arkansas, home to the University of Arkansas, which is the flagship uh, educational institution for the state. Uh, we're a fast growing uh, community and pride ourselves in being uh, welcoming, um, affordable, progressive, bicycle friendly and, um, and a great place to live. Um, more recently, similar to probably almost every other community in the United States, um, we've got um, business closures, school closures, university closed, uh, people working from home, um, social distancing, uh, masks, and, and um, are all the norm uh, currently in Fayetteville as we uh, also deal with the COVID-19. Uh, epidemic. Um, and uh, similar to a lot of other local governments across the country, we're also uh, seeing and or anticipating huge impacts on local government programs uh, as well as local government revenue um, due to many of the um, changes that we've seen in terms of uh, operations and, and business closures um, due to COVID-19. Um, prior to all of that, though, uh, uh, and, and um, and, and continuing even through the epidemic, a uh, big focus for the city has been on uh, climate action. And as was, as was mentioned in, our, uh, in my introduction, um, I led the city's development and ultimate adoption in January of 2018 of the city's first energy action plan. Um, that plan had an overarching goal of reducing the city's carbon emissions by 80% by the year 2050. It focused on carbon emission reductions in four uh, primary focus areas. Those were buildings, energy supply, transportation, and waste. And then it included a cross-sector goal area. Uh, and there's several, uh, as you can see on the slide, um, several uh, additional goals, sub-goals, um, and actions built into each of these goal, goal areas. Uh, one example of which is our goal of 100% clean energy for city government operations by the year 2030. And I'll share with you a project that, uh, that we recently completed that goes a long ways towards doing that. Um, but what I want to focus on today is mainly um, 
uh, a snapshot of how COVID-19, which, you know, is definitely an extreme event, extreme shock to our systems, uh, is already impacting our work uh, to implement the Energy Action Plan and impacting other, um, other elements of city government operations within Fayetteville. So one of the first uh, areas of, of significant impact was in our uh, waste diversion um, area. So again, that's one of the, the four primary goal areas of our Energy Action Plan. We were targeting 40% a waste diversion goal by the year 2027. Uh, we sit at about a 20% waste diversion right now, so we wanted to double that. Um, in that energy action plan, we were striving to, to increase access uh, for businesses and multifamily for recycling. We wanted to launch and, um, and, and do a better job of uh, composting food waste, and then we wanted to focus on um, capturing construction and demolition waste. Um, Direct result of the COVID-19 impact has been a uh, suspension of our curbside recycling program um, for a number of reasons. We, uh, we do a, a curb sort recycling program where our drivers sort the recyclables at the curb into the truck uh, from each resident. We had um, strong concerns about employee exposure on contaminated recyclables and then the potential for community spread as a driver goes down the street from house to house uh, as reasons for doing that even though it was very painful for us uh, to suspend that service. Um, and we, uh, we, we have, um, as part of uh, new programs, we've launched uh, four additional drop-off recycling locations for our residents to take those recyclables to, since they're not currently being collected uh, curbside. Um, but consequently, we've seen about a four-fold reduction in the amount of recyclables that we're collecting um, in the past three weeks since we've uh, implemented this change. Um, we've also seen significant cuts in uh, or reductions in um, particularly in the commercial sector and service that uh, our businesses are asking for. So uh, that has uh, consequently um, reduced revenue coming into the division. Um, we've seen a big drop in the commercial food waste that we collect with all of the uh, restaurants that have been um, shuttered or furloughed across the community. Um, one interesting impact is a huge increase in compost sales. So our, our food waste that we were collecting, we bring that in, we mix it with yard waste, and we generate a, uh, and we produce a usable um, compost product. Uh, we have seen just a massive increase in our residents coming in and buying that uh, food waste, uh, we believe, to, uh, to deal with some of the food insecurity um, challenges that we in, uh, envision um, the community seeing as this epidemic is moving forward. Uh, also, another a consequence of the uh, of the epidemic has been a delay in terms of implementation of our um, uh, styrofoam ban uh, that was set to go into effect on May 1st. That's been delayed to um, July 1st, and we had single-use uh, disposable bag legislation at City Council set to go to uh, on a second reading um, on a meeting earlier in March, and that's also been delayed. Uh, I mentioned our new recycling drop-off. Uh, locations. We've also launched uh, a new food waste drop-off location to try and add to the amount of food waste that we're bringing into our program. Um, in the transportation area, we had goals around reducing uh, vehicle miles traveled. That's what BMT is um, to 2010 levels. And then we also wanted to uh, essentially double our bike walk and transit load share to 25%. Um, I was on the phone with Arkansas Department of Transportation earlier this week, getting some numbers relative to uh, vehicular um, transportation uh, impacts, and they're reporting a 40% drop in urban areas in Arkansas in terms of uh, vehicular uh, passenger vehicle traffic and a 10% drop in the amount of um, truck, truck traffic uh, on our streets. And then uh, converse to that, we are measuring a 55% increase in folks using our multi-use trail system. We have about 45 miles of paved trails in the city. So folks walking and biking uh, or using micro-mobility, which has also seen some significant impacts. We have two micro-mobility providers in the city. Spin um, has scooters and they actually furloughed their scooter program uh, on about March 20th. Uh, three days prior to that, VO Ride, the other micro-mobility provider in the city who, who previously had only provided bikes and e-bikes, um, they actually launched uh, 250 scooters in our community. Um, VO Rides reporting a, uh, uh, an increase in the ride length of uh, for their e-bikes um, and, and scooters uh, as well. 
and uh, they're also seeing a major shift in terms of the hubs where those uh, scooters are being aggregated at. So instead of the University of Arkansas and our downtown being major hubs, um, since those are both uh, largely uh, ghost towns now, um, been a huge hub shift to many of the grocery stores and other um, uh, food locations across the city. In terms of energy, one of our other primary goals um, was to reduce building energy consumption and increase energy supply, ener increase clean energy supply across the city. Um, the pictures on the screen show uh, a recent uh, flip the switch of a 10 megawatt solar array project and 24 megawatt hour battery storage project at our wastewater treatment plants that uh, took us from about a 16% clean energy number for the city government operations all the way up to 72% clean energy. Um, and um, we also had done a lot of work around LEDs, both in buildings and on a limited basis on uh, streets and on uh, trail lighting. So uh, since, since the COVID-19 epidemic, we've really uh, pushed down the accelerator on several projects around energy. Uh, we're looking at another five megawatts of solar um, to service uh, some other buildings that we have uh, in the city. And then um, working with our electric utility who recently approved an LED streetlight uh, suite, we're working to do uh, proactive LED streetlight replacement across the city as well. Um, we were doing a, a biosolids handling uh, revamp at our wastewater treatment plant and looking at doing biogas production there and using that biogas to put into the natural gas system as, uh, as clean natural gas and then also working on um, doing uh, electric vehicle charging stations on several of our parking lots in the downtown area. Um, so this is a, uh, a snapshot of what our uh, greenhouse gas inventory looks like in the um, in the five major areas, uh, electricity, vehicle miles traveled, uh, natural gas, landfill, and wastewater. Um, we, uh, our 2019 numbers show that we were 3% down, 3% um, decrease in terms of uh, the number from 2018, and then uh, we're 3% we're down as compared to our 2010 baseline number, which are both good. Uh, per capita emissions are down 22%, which is really, really good. Uh, as we've grown in, um, in population, we've decreased slightly our um, total emissions, but decreased significantly our per capita emissions. Um, the VMT numbers that I mentioned earlier, if, if we were able to uh, sustain that, uh, that drop in vehicle miles traveled that the Department of Transportation is reporting, um, for a full year, we'd actually see a 20% drop in our community greenhouse gas emissions. So it'll be interesting to see as we come out of this epidemic what those ZMT numbers um, look like and how that impacts our overall greenhouse gas inventory for 2020. Uh, a couple other areas that I just wanted to uh, uh, touch on real quick. I mentioned food policy. So uh, food security is um, definitely of importance um, in the city. And we see, you know, we've seen a lot of new unemployed and underemployed um, citizens and a lot of uh, need for um, for uh, providing food to those folks. Uh, we've done previous work in 2014 around urban agriculture. Um, and as a result of COVID-19, uh, our farmer's market has had to relocate. Uh, we've seen a decrease in the amount of uh, farm table food coming from our surrounding uh, agriculture sector to our restaurants and the community that are now uh, being shuttered. And then of course, um, significant unemployment and food insecurity. So. Several new programs that we're in the process of launching. Um, we've already got several grocery stores operating, excuse me, several restaurants operating as um, as grocers doing online ordering and selling direct to uh, farm uh, in that same farm to table model as they were doing before as restaurants. Um, our compost program, we've, we've seen the increase in folks coming to purchase compost from, at our facilities. We're also launching a compost uh, delivery program. Tomorrow we'll do our first deliveries of compost and have a low income and uh, no income um, component of that that offers free compost. We're doing free vegetable starts as well through our Parks and Recreation Department um, out to low income residents. Uh, we're working to, to develop an urban, ag urban agriculture education series as well to help educate folks on how to, uh, how to do urban agriculture. And then our school district has really stepped up and um, is providing free meals to students and others across the community. That's a really exciting development. Um, final thing I wanted to show is uh, one effort where we're trying to make uh, lemonade out of lemons um, in terms of our Earth Day activities scheduled for next week. 
Uh, in previous years, we've done a, a massive cleanup along our trail system where we invited the uh, community to come together and hear the mayor do an Earth Day proclamation and then go out and uh, pick up litter. Uh, this year, we're doing that as a uh, more um, distributed model where we're handing out um, litter grabbers and t-shirts to folks and asking them to go uh, collect litter in their neighborhood and um, sign a pledge online uh, to do so and then um, leave that um, aggregated litter in locations where we can come pick it up. So an effort to really just try and um, still have an Earth Day event and uh, leverage and harness some of the community interest in um, helping out and uh, making Fayetteville uh, a better place to live and, and cleaning up our community, um, but doing so with uh, safe social distancing measures in place. Um, that's all I have for my presentation. Uh, with that, I'd be uh, happy to pass it over to Christine uh, to tell us what's going on up in Philly. Thanks, Peter. Um, let me get my screen going here. Can everyone see that? Good? Looks good. Okay, thanks. Um, so, yeah, um, again, I'm Christine Knapp. I'm the director of Philadelphia's Office of Sustainability. Um, I've been in the position for about four years, a little over four years now. Um, our office uh, coordinates the city's sustainability framework, which is called Greenworks. Um, it's made up of sort of eight key vision areas. A lot of what Peter went through is um, very similar to the sort of breadth of the work that we take on as well. Um, but of course, climate change has been sort of the um, the main focus of our work for the last several years. Um, and Philadelphia, um, under Mayor Kenny's leadership, has really stepped up in terms of climate leadership. Um, the mayor's committed Philadelphia to meeting the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement um, and has committed the, the city to 100% renewable energy. Um, the mayor was just re-inaugurated in January and made climate resiliency and adaptation a key priority for the second term. Um, so sort of adding um, to our climate mitigation goals, a, a whole new sort of climate adaptation planning um, effort that we were hoping to launch in July, which I think now will obviously be facing a different timeline. Um, the thread through both our mitigation and adaptation work, though, is that we see climate change as a multiplier of risks and of opportunities. Um, and so particularly when it comes to risk, um, that's the area that we're most concerned with and I think that has the most sort of analogies to the COVID-19 response um, is that the folks who are already the most vulnerable, um, who are sort of already at risk um, because of poverty, because of violence, because of um, other sort of, um, you know, health uh, uh, sort of issues, those are the same folks who are the most likely to be impacted by any sort of, um, you know, layering of other risks. So client, those folks are going to be at risk for climate change um, in terms of the, the impact that climate change will have on Philadelphia. And they're also the, the folks who are right now um, experiencing the most impacts from the COVID. So I see a lot of sort of connections between um, the COVID response and the climate change um, and climate emergency response that I'll try to touch on. Um, so unlike uh, uh, Peter's presentation, I kind of just picked out a few things um, to focus in on. Um, we do have a municipal energy master plan um, that we put out in 2017, it was the first time our city had an energy master plan. It's focused on the built environment, which makes up about 80% of Philadelphia's carbon footprint locally. Um, and all of our goals are to be met by 2030, which is to um, cut uh, energy use by 20%, reduce carbon emissions by 50%, and move to 100% renewable electricity by 2030. Um, for the for the municipal built environment. Um, so we basically have two options for how to do that. We have to use cleaner energy and we have to use less energy. Um, on the um, the cleaner energy front, this is a project that we're really proud of. Um, it's currently called the Adam Solar LLC project, but we actually are, we're running a naming competition for it um, that we were gonna announce on Earth Day. I think we might postpone that. Um, but we got a lot of fun um, naming suggestions, including the obvious solar mix solar face, um, which we are not going to do. Um, but this is a, a power purchase agreement project um, with a third party. Uh, it was developed by Community Energy and is now owned by NG. Um, and they will be building a 70 megawatt um, solar facility in Adams County, which is about two hours from Philadelphia on 700 acres of land. And the great thing for Philadelphia is um, that we don't do anything. Um, we uh, just buy the electricity that the site will produce. 
um, over the course of 20 years, and we fix the price for that electricity now. So as future electricity prices increase, we'll likely save money over the course of that 20 years. So it slots in nicely with our energy procurement strategy um, over the long term, um, and also contributes to um, local economic development and through to job creation. Um, which leads me to um, sort of another project that we've been um, proud to uh, be a partner in with our Philadelphia Energy Authority, which is a quasi-governmental entity um, that we that we work with um, on this Bright Solar Futures uh, program, which is a career and technical education program for high school students, um, the first in um, in the state to to do that. Um, and so we have planning on having the first class of 10th graders starting in, um, the, in the fall, uh, which got underway. And um, you know now the school year is sort of complete for so the end of this year. So um, we'll have to figure out how to finish out the, the training that, um, that students missed out on. But um, we think this has a tremendous opportunity to ramp up um, over time and then to help uh, place folks who have gone through the program into other programs um, particularly for Philadelphia, we have a very popular solarized program, um, sort of like a bulk purchasing program for residential properties that um, keeps growing. Um, we're about to offer the fourth round of solarized um, on Earth Day. Um, we also have a solar rebate program that just launched, um, literally, I think, uh, like when all the COVID stuff started uh, hitting, I think it was like March 20th that the program opened and we've already had over 100 applications. Um, so this gives folks either a 10 cent per watt rebate for commercial or a 20 cent watt uh, per watt rebate for residential programs. So it helps to really support solar growth in our community and creates more opportunities for these students to slide right into um, their careers. Um, another sort of major piece of work um, that we have been thinking about, particularly from the equity lens, um, is about the, the Philadelphia Gas Works, which is owned by the city of Philadelphia. It's the largest municipally owned gas utility in the country. Um, there are 1,600 workers there that serves 500,000 customers. Um, we identified this as an issue in a document called Powering Our Future, which is our clean energy vision um, for how to meet our 80 by 60 goal in the built environment. And recognizing that moves towards 100% electricity, um, the pathway is pretty clear, if, even if difficult, but the pathway for thermal load was much harder um, to see what that would look like for Philadelphia. And given that we have you know, four robust seasons with, um, with very cold winters, we definitely need to be thinking about how we heat our buildings as well. Um, so we're part of the Bloomberg American Cities Climate Challenge, and this was a um, something that we're tackling with support through that climate challenge um, to basically take on a business diversification study to understand how the utility can continue to exist in the future um, and even thrive in the future um, to retain that workforce and to continue to provide necessary services, particularly to our low income customers, um, but doing it in a way that also um, helps us to achieve our low carbon future goals. Um, so looking at both energy sources and then energy services to understand um, what the opportunity is and to set a path forward. I think it's clear here to also say that as people who can afford to electrify do that, folks who cannot afford to will be left with the, the, the price tag for maintaining the entire PGW system. And so there's a real equity um, imp impact for, of doing nothing. Um, and letting that happen. So we, we know that we have to do something and we also need to be thinking about that 1600 person workforce and their transition path as well. Um, and then another piece, um, our building energy performance policy, um, which uh, we passed in the fall, this will require our large non-commercial buildings to either achieve a high performance building standard um, or to tune up their buildings. This is a huge carbon cutting project for the city um, we don't believe that the timeline will be slowed down at all by COVID since our first compliance period is still a ways out and we're still writing the detailed regulations on this. Um, but we are excited about this because our build, big buildings have an outsized impact on carbon emissions. Um, and we um, have estimates that this could create as many as 600 local jobs in performing um, those tune-ups. So it's going to be great for our local economic development and ho hopefully economic recovery after COVID is um, hopefully gone. So in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, climate adaptation and our risks 
um, I meant, you know, we basically talk about our risks as being both wetter and hotter in the future. Um, while, you know, we will certainly have sea level rise and increased precipitation and storms, we look relatively good compared to our other East Coast cities because we're 200 miles inland. Um, so it's not not a concern, but um, what, what uh, keeps me up more at night is thinking about the heat issue because it's so insidious and um, we already have this situation in Philadelphia right now. This is average surface temperature mapping that was actually complete about five years ago that, can, that shows there could be as much as a 22 degree difference between um, neighborhoods in Philadelphia on the same day. And so when we look at the projections of increased temperatures, um, we know those neighborhoods that are already desperately um, hot will get hotter. And so we really wanted to jump in to think about, you know, why is that the case? Why is there such a difference in these neighborhoods and what can we do um, to start addressing that? And so just being very, really clear about the history of, um, of redlining and racial inequity as a root cause of this, um, this heat dis uh, disparity, um, that you know, all of these neighborhoods that are hotter than average are um, majority Latinx or, or African American neighborhoods, and they're all low income neighborhoods. So um, we can see a distinct line drawn between sort of past racial um, discriminatory actions that have led to this situation. Um, you can see that in um, in the lack of tree canopy and lack of green spaces in this one neighborhood of Hunting Park that we focused in on. Um, increased industry, which is not surprising, again, with redlining, a lot of communities of color were sort of pushed into neighborhoods that were less desirable, that were closer to industry. Um, and also the black roofs and dark surfaces uh, is a demonstration that there's been not as much redevelopment in those communities. Um, we've had a white roof or reflective roof, roof ordinance in effect since, um, I believe, about 2010. So in communities where a lot of new houses have been um, either built or redeveloped, you'll see a lot of white roofs, but in communities that haven't seen that investment, you'll still see a lot of black roofs that um, draw heat in. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities um, to, that, that have been identified by the community as ways to address um, heat, both short-term and long-term. Um, I think one, the one thing I wanna point out is that we were planning on um, launching a community heat relief network this summer in Hunting Park in some, um, uh, churches and faith institutions who are going to sort of open their spaces up with air conditioning and provide some resources and some, um, you know, sort of amenities and food and activities that we now are having to rethink our strategy um, in light of the larger COVID epidemic and thinking about how if folks are continuing to be encouraged to stay at home, um, how can we support folks to be cool at home if they don't have air conditioning or if they don't, if they're worried about being able to pay their electricity bill for running their air conditioning. And so this is where we're really focusing in a lot of our attention at the moment to think about um, what a new strategy is for helping folks um, deal with high heat this summer. Um, and so that I think is a, you know, an example of the larger questions around how do these sort of two um, major risk factors like combine and how can we sort of try to address them together um, so that what we're doing to address COVID and supporting folks through this crisis also sets us up for supporting folks through um, the climate crisis as well. Um, I think that is the end of my time. Great. Thanks, Christine, so much for that. Um, we're going to go move into our Q&A now. So as folks type your questions into the questions panel to the right of your screen, we're actually going to start with Trip, who has a question um, to start us off with the Q&A as you guys type your questions in. So over to you, Trip. Sure. Um, yeah, my first question is for, for Peter. Um, and uh, you mentioned how Fayetteville is making lemons out of lemonade during this difficult period, showing pockets of resiliency and self-reliance um, that have emerged. Um, but wondering, you know, has this created, you know, an opening to sort of shift the pace and scale around your goals on energy, waste, and mobility? Have, you know, is there mindsets that have shifted that you think, you know, people see the need for a more resilient energy or mobility system uh, in the future? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and the answer is absolutely yes. Um, two examples that I'll point to that I, I maybe went over a little too quickly in my presentation, but um, additional, the five megawatts of additional solar and um, looking at additional LED streetlights. 
So both of those projects, you know, are identified as part of our strategy of reducing energy consumption or transitioning to clean energy. And and when we've when we've done projects like that in the past, we've always talked about the energy savings associated with them as well. Um, but in light of the uh, economic downturn that we're anticipating and um, the the hit that we anticipate seeing in terms of um, sales tax revenue and money coming in the city budgets, we're um, we're pr pr placing even greater emphasis on those projects that will save the city money both near term and long term because we see the uh, the economic realities ahead of us. And so I think that's the that's one of the openings um, that will allow projects that you know are already on the on uh, a priority, but allows us to uh, you know really push the gas on those and press even harder for those because they not only they not only check the box in terms of our um, our carbon emission goals, but they also speak to our finance department's priorities as well as trying to balance the books and um, and uh, keep the city uh, out of the red. Yeah, great, thank you. And then um, my second question, this is for Christine, the Huntington Park Beat the Heat program puts in stark relief um, how the prospect of multiple simultaneous extreme events of COVID-19 and potential heat waves this summer will disproportionately impact those disadvantaged communities and imagine exasperate that trade-off between allocating resources to provide short-term relief with maybe access to air conditioners or air conditioned space um, and investments in the longer term solutions like the tree canopies and the roof, roof resurfacing. I'm um, just wondering, you know, what are the ways in which you and, and your colleagues in the city are thinking about managing that, that tension? Yeah, I mean, I think um, we felt that uh, very clearly from residents when we um, began talking to them um, last summer and the, the launch of the, the heat pilot um, that we were, you know, thinking about the long term um, too much and wanting to plant trees and do things that would really have a impact on cooling in the short term. And then the, you know, that's the, the value of having a community led process. They very quickly pivoted us to thinking about we need to help people cope with heat right now um, and we need to be able to kind of do both at what the same time we need to be thinking about um, sort of the, 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 the near term and right now knowing again that the, the summer is going to pose particular challenges we really need to be thinking about this you know upcoming summer right now and, and really um, operationalizing some some quick responses but at the same time not keep losing the thread of the long term um, so we're thinking about things like um, the way that the state uses LIHEAP um, dollars. Um, traditionally, have only been for heating bills. Um, and there was a $900, $900 million increase in LIHEAP in the, um, in the stimulus package that currently Pennsylvania wouldn't allow to be used for, um, for air conditioning bills. But we're now trying to see if we can get that done um, for this summer. And if we can't, well, we can at least try to make that um, argument for the future uh, that if we want to support residents in using electricity, using the air conditioner that they have, but they're not using because of their fear of the cost, then we need to, um, you know, help that help folks with that, um, with those bills in order to really protect their lives. Um, you know, because that's what it comes down to when it comes to, you know, heat exposure in these communities is literally putting people's lives at risk. So, um, you know, I think the answer is we have to do both, um, which is hard, <laughs> but um, but necessary. Great. Thanks, Trip, for those first two questions that answered a lot of the questions that have come in um, from our attendees. Thanks, everybody, for these questions. A couple questions. We have recorded the webinar so that it will be available to you. We will email it out to you so you can share it and review it, as well as the PDF of the slides. So um, that will be coming to you. So that answers a few questions. Um, Amy Butt. Bittenhat Huis, I hope I'm saying that right, Amy. Um, she says, and this is for you, Christine, um, and at the City of Toronto, they're grappling with this question right now. Um, are you considering opening cooling centers this summer and doing screening for COVID or just closing all cooling centers and encouraging people to stay home? Thoughts about cooling centers for the summer? Yeah, we're, we're, we're still kind of figuring out what we may want to do about cooling centers. Um, they have historically been operated out of our libraries, um, which are closed right now. Um, so we have to kind of um, factor in the cost of reopening, staffing, 
um, you know, cooling, um, cleaning, obviously those spaces versus providing um, cooling spaces in, in other locations um, or just not ha hosting them at all. Um, I've been sort of thinking about the approach in three buckets. There's helping people who don't have air conditioning equipment at all. There's helping folks who have air conditioning equipment but don't use it because of the, the fear of, you know, their bills. And then there's unhoused folks. And I think that's the group for whom we may need to think about having some version of a cooling center um, of, of some kind. It may not operate as they've traditionally operated, um, but we're still trying to really explore um, sort of responses for all three of those scenarios. Um, and I'd be happy to connect with you offline if you want to compare notes about how you're thinking about it as well. Great. And your email is available on that last slide that we're on right now. So get in touch with Christine about that. Um, Hillary Reeves has a question for you, Peter. Has there been meant much special deals or accommodations for essential workers on micro mobility or transit in Fayetteville? It's uh, a discussion that we're beginning to have. Uh, one of our two trans transit providers has uh, is operated by the University of Arkansas, and they are they have significantly dialed back the transit service they're providing. Um, so yeah, I was just on the phone this morning with um, one of the two micro mobility providers about what uh, what um, what a, a arrangement could look like working directly with some of the employers in town around um, providing uh, micro mobility access uh, in 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 place of transit access, and then also trying to trying to uh, push for more uh, low income and no income access to micro mobility. Right. Okay, good. Well, we'll want an update from you at some point on that um, as cities across the country are struggling with this uh, balance of, of um, continuing service in the midst of um, service <laughs> not being in, in demand much. So um, there's a bunch of questions uh, and I'll ask Dan Beatty's questions uh, for the others who've asked this. And so this is both for Christine and Peter. Um, Peter, maybe for you first, the COVID crisis is going to cause a lot of big disruptions to municipal budgets in the next couple of years. You already talked about that a little bit with sales tax revenue going down. What in your mind is the best approach to ensuring that sustainability and resiliency strategies can maintain uh, an important and high level of priority and not suffer from budget cuts? I know you talked a little, you touched on that a little bit. But can you elaborate a bit more um, on your thoughts on that? Uh, I can try, um, but it, yes, I have heard um, from colleagues across the country who've already had offices um, shut uh, due to budget impacts um, from cities, and uh, it's it, unfortunately it's not something that's getting talked about in the media. Is that that impact that you know is trickling all the way down to communities? But a lot of us are really dependent on sales tax. I oversee our parking division at the city of Fayetteville. Uh, it's a two million dollar budget, and um, you know our revenue has decreased by roughly sixty five percent in in terms of uh, that division. So it's 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 real for cities, uh, absolutely. So I would say to those that are uh, trying to uh, figure out how to carve out a niche for themselves to stay afloat, um, you know, it's about adding value with with projects and programs again that can um, can save money. Um, can uh, provide those essential services uh, to the community that can, um, you know, there's, there's uh, probably a lane for those that have uh, specialization in accessing grant dollars. Uh, we, en we envision philanthropy stepping up in the near term to help uh, supplement with, uh, with, with program programming in a lot of areas. So uh, grant making and, and grant writing and grant management is probably an area that a lot of folks should look to uh, shift to their focus to to help bring in uh, revenue and monies to cities to help augment um, losses. Um, so those are some just some initial uh, thoughts and ideas I've got. Christine, if you've got others, I'm taking notes for sure. Yeah, I would um, I would definitely echo your sentiment to kind of connect into with other sort of critical needs. Um, we the city government for us was in a moment for the first few weeks of response where we were designated as either essential or non-essential. And it was a great moment to demonstrate how essential so much of our work actually is. Um, so our, uh, our energy team was um, all designated as essential and our food policy 
uh, advisor um, manager was designated as essential. So I think those two areas were 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 you know made obvious as how important that work is for um, for delivering on a, you know really critical life critical um, services. I think going forward, the you know I said we were going to we were going to launch a climate adaptation planning process that had we had a lot of you know strong buy-in from the mayor. He put it in his budget address uh, from our city managing director. Um, you know I think the timeline will likely shift on that, but I think the buy-in, if I would hope, is even further strengthened in the demonstration of how you know this is a this is a, a very fast, quick pandemic that you know will hopefully come and go really quickly. But understanding the um, analogies to the climate crisis and how that will have some similar impacts that I think it will only demonstrate the, the critical nature of doing that work and being thoughtful and having emergency plans um, and having plans to protect our residents, particularly our most vulnerable residents, ahead of, um, ahead of time rather than having to respond to it in real time. So I'm hopeful that we'll, we'll be able to prove that value. But also, you know, just to be clear, we're, we're definitely looking down, um, you know, major loss of revenue and and likely major cuts as well. Um, I don't know, you know, how much our office will um, be impacted by any of that, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, some of our, some work is impacted, but we'll, we're just gonna have to see how that pans out um, over the, the coming weeks. Great, thanks for that, you guys. Um, I think we're all hoping everybody on this, <laughs> in the US on the on the webinar, I know we have folks sometimes from 50 or 50 countries on our webinars, and at least in the US we're hoping there's another bill in the next week that um, includes cities and local, local communities to help buffer that massive blow that we're all in the midst of. So, um, but Trip, I wanted to ask you, I mean, how from your work over the last 15 years, are there any creative financing or funding mechanisms that you think can make a difference right now? There's some questions here from the audience about, um, various different you know financing tools like property assessed clean energy for financing and retrofitting of commercial commercial properties um you know solar work is there something you want to say about how we can ensure these projects move forward and are financed sure um i was actually on a call yesterday talking about that um so angie does um help a lot with coordination of financing for solar projects, for energy efficiency projects. Um, and I think, you know, particularly with, actually with both, um, because they really do help lower costs, with solar with ongoing energy costs, and then obviously with the savings of energy efficiency, um, that there's just still a ton of capital that is still looking to find those kinds of projects. And in fact, I view kind of our job is going and, and finding those opportunities and then helping our clients coordinate the financing um, for it. Um, so I think there's certainly private money in, in terms of, of, of debt um, that's still uh, available, um, but it's also also new. So I think, you know, what does the new normal begin to look like? But you know, we have one deal in the process that's still um, moving, moving forward. Um, and we are still, you know, identifying new projects and helping line up financing for it. Great. Thanks for that. We want more, more from you in a month <laughs> so we can all keep all these good projects and new jobs like we heard from Christine going. Um, so uh, a couple of questions um, from about food policy. Um, Christine, does your office collaborate with the food policy folks, and how do you how are you guys thinking? Are your office dealing with food equity, or is that another part of the of the um, of the city department somewhere else? No, that's uh, the food policy advisory council is managed through staff in our office, so that's that's definitely one of our core um, functions. And yeah, I think immediately um, our folks sort of sprung into response uh, at first for providing meals for students who normally got um, meals you know, at school once the schools were closed, and then quickly thereafter um, for anybody in the city. So we now have um, distribution sites throughout the city where folks can go. They don't need an ID or anything to pick up a box of, of food. And so it's been a massive coordination effort across multiple city departments and agencies, um, relying on a, a mostly volunteer um, workforce from warehousing to trucking to distribution. So 
Um, that's been, you know, sort of a huge uh, amount of work that our, um, our food policy folks have taken on. We've also are in the midst of an urban agriculture master planning process um, where all the community engagement was like just about to launch. And so we're, you know, putting some new thought around, you know, that engagement process, but also reflecting on the increased value that um, urban agriculture is having right now. I think Peter sort of mentioned this as well, that, you know, there's a high demand now for folks who are feeling in food insecure to be able to garden, um, you know, whether that's on a community garden site or just at their home in, you know, container gardens or otherwise. So we're also trying to um, work with our uh, William Penn Foundation, our, our regional funder who's funding the urban ag master planning process to also think about how to expand that funding into supporting the urban agriculture community at large um, so that they can continue to serve the need for communities that we're seeing a, you know, an increased demand on. Great. Yeah, and I know there's some questions about uh, the Fayetteville urban ag work, which, which Peter, you touched on in your slide. So if you guys missed that, you can look at the recording. But um, on how there has been an increased sales and in, in massive increased sales in composting, and now you're starting your compost delivery tomorrow. But do you want to say anything else, Peter, about COVID-related increased urban ag and neighborhood sales activities? That's a question from Nicole Savita, who says hi. Yeah, Nicole helped us with our 2014 urban agriculture ordinance. Hi, back to you, Nicole. Um, I would just say it's there's been a um, been a much greater emphasis and focus on the need and it's re sort of invigorated uh, work that we had done um, previously um, and we're you know we're working to you know, with all the stakeholders across the community to do much of the same stuff that uh, Christine was mentioning going on um, in Philadelphia and there's definitely a need out there and we're uh, we're trying our best to to meet it um, and and lead where it's appropriate for the city to lead and to work with our stakeholders uh, out in the community in areas where it's best uh, for them to lead uh, in terms of addressing food insecurity. Great, and a one further question from Vic Randall. Could you elaborate on how Fayetteville's restaurants have been used, have used the ability to operate as grocers to generate business and meet community food needs? And has local ag distribution in the form of pop-up markets been tied to operating restaurants? Yes, absolutely. So couple, uh, uh, our business license regulations were um, were essentially waived or were changed as part of the emergency decree that happened in March. And so now uh, restaurants can operate as grocers and sell uh, food and alcohol uh, beverages in closed containers uh, for folks to take home. So yeah, a couple of, uh, of our restaurants that really focused in farm to table are now uh, operating as online markets where they take orders on um, like Sunday, and then they do uh, distribution or pickup of food that's coming from um, essentially the local area and local farmers on Tuesday and Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So that, that's absolutely the model that's happening. There's another couple of restaurants that are doing it, um, operating more like um, uh, sort of like uh, um, just stop and shop uh, types of activities where they had, uh, you know, a surplus of uh, food and, and, and products um, that they were planning on using to make prepared food, and now they're selling that as uh, packaged items um, in, a, in a, a sort of a more grocery store or neighborhood market. Great. And um, this is a question from Richard Mitchell, who was, um, hi Richard, his, was the planning director for the city of Richmond, California for multiple decades, so hi Richard, but he's wondering, first for Peter and you, and then um, Christine for you, are, are is there, um, is it feasible to consider installing installing roof gardens on flat roofs in Fayetteville? And then over to you, Christine Philly, because I know Philly has a lot of flat roofs. So Peter first. Yeah, there's a there's definitely a burgeoning uh, green roof movement um, in Fayetteville, and um, you know, we're we're much more low density than a large city like like Philadelphia uh, is. So. I think it is feasible to do gardening on roofs, but I think it's probably, uh, there's probably a lot lower hanging fruit, no pun intended, in terms of uh, just finding space in yards uh, or in community gardens on the ground uh, to, do, uh, to do farming and gardening. Uh, yeah, and Christine, that might, there might have added benefits with lowering urban heat island effect with roofs, but thoughts about roof gardens? Yeah, I think that sort of green roofs are certainly um, also 
sort of growing in Philadelphia, um, mostly for stormwater, stormwater management purposes, but less so for, for gardening. Um, I think the major issue for, for gardening is um, most folks don't have access to their roofs um, unless they have built, you know, a roof deck, which can be sort of expensive. Um, so while, you know, land is at a premium, we do actually have a lot of um, community gardens in the city and um, a lot of vacant land that can be used for gardening, which again is why we're kind of undertaking this urban garden master plan. So um, I think that's, that's more likely, you know, sort of we have, Typical Philly row home has a tiny little backyard um, where folks can do container gardens or retaining wall gardens um, um, or work in their community sort of spaces. I think that's probably going to be more likely than folks getting access to their roof. Yeah. Um, great. And we have a question about taking advantage of the stimulus, federal stimulus money and how you guys are preparing. Um, are you thinking about infrastructure projects? And Christine, do you think any of the stimulus funds that have already been designated could be used, for instance, to help with the heat um, issues this summer? Yeah, so we've been, we definitely been thinking about it. We, um, Philadelphia was well positioned to receive a lot of ERA dollars in the, the 2008-9 um, sort of recovery phase. Um, I think in some de degree that's probably in part because we always have more ambitions than we have money to carry things out. So we had a lot of, you know, good ideas and projects that kind of ready to be implemented that just needed those dollars. And so um, we want to be in a position again of being able to take advantage of dollars as they come. So we already have a lot of transportation projects, um, transit improvement projects um, in mind in partnership with our, um, our transit authority, SEPSA, um, but also on the heat um, Front, I did mention the, the LIHEAP um, increase in dollars. So I think that's something that we really want to explore um, if we only use LIHEAP dollars for heating, we're going to miss the opportunity to help folks this summer um, at such a critical time. So that's a state level um, policy decision that we're hoping to engage the governor's office and the state um, DHS um, agency to kind of discuss, a, a, you know, even if it's not forever, but a, a short term sort of policy switch to be able to take advantage of those dollars as they flow into the state. Great. Peter, thoughts from you about taking advantage of federal stimulus money? Yeah, I can add quickly that um, we, uh, we're we seeing uh, a little over $7 million coming in as part of the first CARES bill uh, for transit in, um, in our region. Uh, also, we're looking at uh, there's some additional dollars coming in through the CDBG program, so we're looking at that and trying to figure out the best way to leverage those dollars. Uh, I was on a call yesterday. Um, with a couple of uh, members of uh, climate mayor, a climate mayor's group that we're part of, and uh, they were talking about uh, stimulus dollars for uh, wastewater treatment plant upgrades that generate biogas, uh, which is a project we were already working on. So we're going to take a closer look at that as a possible um, funding strategy and uh, opportunity to generate revenue off of a waste product. Um, and then uh, the thing that's uh, of most critical importance to communities of our size and for those other mid-sized communities across the country where I would encourage you to uh, reach out to your congressional representatives is um, getting in the next, uh, whatever the next funding bill is, making sure that cities uh, that are smaller than, cities and communities smaller than $500,000, 500000 in population are specifically designated as recipients uh, of funding uh, because the previous bill only allocated funding to uh, entities that were 500,000 people and larger. So it cut out a whole swath of uh, small and mid-sized uh, communities across our country. Yeah, great point, Peter. And the majority of the cities in the United States are 60,000 and less. So <laughs> we uh, need to do a better job on that. Um, thanks so much for that comment to wrap us up. And I know we're a minute over, but uh, obviously incredibly important points these last two um, comments from Peter and Christine and thank you so much Trip, for your time today as well and hoping to hear more about financing and keeping these projects going in the face of of um of what we're all facing right now and so I'm gonna well, we have to wrap up and we're a short survey is gonna pop up once you all close your browser and we really appreciate your feedback um, we hope to see everybody at our next webinar. We do webinars every three weeks. Um, thanks for your comments about how well run this was. Um, a couple of you in, our, in the questions, we appreciate that. We've been at this eight years, so hopefully they're good by now. And um, all of our webinars are available in the events section of our website at meaningoftheminds.org. You can see previous webinars there as well if you click on previous events. 
Big thanks to our presenters today for taking your time to share your work with us. Thank you, Tripp, Peter, and Christine. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. You too. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Christine. Bye, Tripp.